Welcome to the Lifelong Learners Podcast. If you love to learn, you love to explore, you're curious, well, this is the podcast for you. Every week, we'll be diving into a different topic, a different lesson, a different discussion, or course on topics ranging from mindfulness to physics, economics, crypto, finance, and Shakespeare. Everything you might be interested in. Hello, I'm Dr. Dina, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this first lesson of our course on everyday mindfulness. It's something that's a huge part of my life, and I'm thrilled to be sharing it with you. You remember that hassled father, the one who stabbed his toes on the Lego blocks he'd cleared away the night before? As you may recall, he called me for help because he wanted some way to keep his cool now on the spot so that despite the shooting pain in his foot, he could still be proud of himself as a father and as a person. Maybe you'd also like to keep your cool if your boss suddenly dumps a load of work on your desk just as you're getting ready to leave for the day, or your computer crashes, or you're quaking in the dentist's chair, or any other hassle you're facing. Each of these situations can trigger you in a split second into rage, into anxiety, into fear. And when that happens and you find yourself knocked off balance, can you still stay calm? Can you keep your sense of humor or regain it? Can you keep your sense of perspective? In other words, can you get between the trigger, that situation that's setting you off, and the automatic reaction you're about to have? Now, maybe you've heard that meditating can do that for you. And it can. But here's the problem. And I say this based on decades of experience as a mindfulness teacher and clinical psychologist. First, many people don't meditate, either not at all or not regularly. And if you don't use it, you lose it. Second, even if you do meditate regularly, you still need something that works on the spot. And that's what you'll be learning in this course. Did you ever hear of the 80-20 rule? The 80-20 rule says that 20% of our effort accomplishes about 80% of the work. That's true for business, economics, time management, even what you wear. And based on what I've heard over the years from many of the people I've worked with, it's true for mindfulness too. When all is said and done, they're most effective most useful takeaway was the stop. The stop technique is the 80 in the 80-20 rule. It's a quick and powerful technique that lets you cope with whatever life dishes out and bounce back quickly. That's why it's the frame around which this entire course is built. So here's the plan. Today, I'll introduce you to the stop. I want you to hit the ground running, so to speak, so you'll learn something powerful that you can start using right away. Then over the coming lessons, we'll dig more deeply into the stop and we'll explore its relationship to mindfulness and a whole host of related topics that I'll spell out for you a bit later in this lesson. At the end of every lesson, I'll also suggest simple ways to practice on your own so you can get the most out of this course. My intention is to give you a thorough and integrated experience of theory and practice. We won't just talk about mindfulness. You'll get to live it and practice it in real time. So let's get started with the stop. Think back to your first driving lesson. What was the first thing your driving instructor taught you? When I took driver's ed in high school, the first thing my driving teacher showed me was where the brake was and how to use it so that I'd know that I could keep myself and people around me safe. 
It's the same in other situations too, like riding a bike, which I do, or skiing, which I don't. The first thing you learn is how to put on the brakes, how to come to a stop quickly and safely for your sake and the sake of everyone around you. Well, the stop is your brake, a fast, effective way to take back control in your life. You've probably come across stop signs many times in your life. If you're outdoors right now, you might see one any moment. You can't miss them. They're big and bright red. Sometimes they actually have the word printed on them, stop. And sometimes it's just a picture of a big hand warning you to stop. And even if you're visually impaired and can't see the stop sign, you still know what to do when you get to that street corner. You stop. Whether you're walking or driving or riding a bike or whatever, you stop and then you wait. You look around, you observe what's happening around you at the intersection. And then when conditions are right, you proceed. You walk, you drive, you pedal, you jog, whatever you're doing, you move on. Our stop technique does the same thing. It stops the flow of stress traffic inside your mind and body. It puts the brakes on whatever is upsetting you, whether that's something nasty going on in your life, an unpleasant feeling, or a scary thought. Whatever's trying to hijack the controls away from you, the stop puts the controls back in your hands. Here's how it works. Stop is an acronym. The S stands for stop, and step out of autopilot. The T stands for take a conscious breath. The O stands for observe. Observe what's going on with you right now. And finally, there's the P, which stands for two things. First, pat yourself on the back or praise yourself. And second, proceed. Don't worry about memorizing this. I promise we're going to repeat this a lot. Ad nauseum, probably. So let's go through each of these, starting with the S. The S stands for stop and step out of autopilot. What do I mean by autopilot? I'm talking about behaviors and feelings that feel familiar. Maybe these are old thoughts about not doing things well. If you step back and look at this closely, you may notice that this feels familiar. You've had these reactions before and they happen like that automatically. That's what I mean by autopilot. And because they're so automatic, they usually drag you along for the ride. Not this time. This time you do a stop. You call time on it, just like a sports referee. Did you ever watch a game? It's moving along, and then either something iffy happens or things begin to spiral out of control, and the referee blows the whistle, calls a timeout, and the action stops. Here's another way to look at this. The Austrian psychiatrist and Holocaust survivor, Viktor Frankl, said, Between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space, lie our freedom and power to choose our response. Because this is so important, I want to say it again. Between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space lie our freedom and power to choose our response. How do you create that space between stimulus and response, between whatever setting you off and your reaction. You do a stop. The stop creates that space, which gives you the freedom and the power to choose what you want to do next. If we were to do a stop right now, what could that mean? Well, the first thing I do is I make a conscious decision to do a stop. For me right now, in real time, as I'm recording this, autopilot could be just going on and on, talk, talk, talking at you. So stopping the autopilot 
means being very conscious of you out there listening to me and of my wish to connect with you, even though it's a recording. For you out there listening to the lesson, being on autopilot might mean passively listening to me talk at you. And stepping out of that autopilot could mean making the conscious decision to take a more active role and do the stop with me. So you become a more active participant. That's what stopping that first letter S in the stop does. It lets us create that space between stimulus and response that Frankel talked about, so we can each have the power and freedom to choose how we want to respond. Now we move to the second part of the stop, the T, which stands for take a conscious breath, breathe, and be aware of breathing. So as you breathe in, know that you're breathing in. As you breathe out, know that you're breathing out. In fact, you can think these lines to yourself as you breathe. So breathing in, I know I'm breathing in, and breathing out, I know I'm breathing out. Breathing is something we do on autopilot. Our bodies just do it naturally. We don't usually pay much attention to it. Now we're taking it off of autopilot and we are paying conscious attention to it. Now we move to the O, the observe phase. You observe, you check. How are you doing? You ask yourself, what are you feeling right now, emotionally? Emotions, feelings can be things like feeling sad, feeling happy, feeling anxious, feeling angry, being lonely, feeling peaceful, or irritated, or frustrated, or satisfied, feeling bored, or feeling excited. And you observe what's going on in your body. What sensations are you noticing? And that can be stuff like tightness, looseness, warmth, coolness, dryness, moisture, tension, feeling calm, feeling awake, feeling sleepy, being hungry, being thirsty, being all hyped up, having no energy, feeling light, feeling heavy. And you also observe what's going on in your mind. What thoughts are coming up? And these don't have to just be words or sentences. These can also be images, pictures, memories. Now, something really important here is that you don't automatically jump to change anything that you notice, anything that you observe. Whatever you're experiencing, whatever you become aware of, you let it be just as it is. This is what's meant by observing something non-judgmentally, without reacting to it in the usual autopilot way. All of these steps, all of these ways of becoming more conscious and aware, let you create some space inside you. And in that space, as Frankel said, you have the freedom and the power to choose what you will proceed to do, which is one of the things that that last part of the stop, the P, stands for. Here's how I think of the proceed. One of my family's favorite TV series of all time was The West Wing. In it, President Jed Bartlett always moved things along with his staff by asking, okay, what's next? That's what the proceed means, what's next? And the other thing that that last letter, the P stands for, is to praise yourself. Pat yourself on the back for doing something important, something pretty radical, actually. We are so used to just charging ahead full steam, not pausing to check in with ourselves to see how we're doing and what we might need. So what we've just done is really important. And you'll understand that more as we go through the course. So now let me talk us through a stop together right now. I'm gonna stop the autopilot of continuing to talk at you. 
and you just being on autopilot and just listening. Okay, that's already doing that first letter, the S in the stop. It's beginning to create some space. And now we're going to move to the second part of the stop, the T. Take a conscious breath. Breathing in. I know I'm breathing in. Breathing out. I know I'm breathing out. And now we move to the O, the observe. You observe, you check. How are you doing overall? What are you feeling emotionally? Right now, without changing anything. What's going on in your body? What sensations are you noticing? Again, don't change a thing, just observe. And what thoughts are arising? And again, don't change anything. Let it be just as it is. This is non-judgmental awareness. And now we come to the P, which stands for two things. Remember, praise and proceed. Praise yourself for doing this. This is important. Taking yourself for granted is another form of autopilot. It's very important to pay attention to the good stuff that happens to you and especially the good things that you do. Appreciate yourself. This contributes to well-being and reduces stress. And then you proceed to whatever you choose to do next. What's next? What's next is for us to see how that frustrated Lego father of ours might use this. So he notices that he's about to blow. And instead, he blows the whistle on himself. He does a stop, puts on the brakes. He's just created that precious space between the trigger and his reaction. And that space gives him the power and the freedom to choose a different way to respond to the situation. Then he takes a conscious breath. As he breathes in, he's aware that he's breathing in. As he breathes out, He's aware that he's breathing out. Then he observes. He checks what's going on inside of him. Maybe he notices feelings like anger or helplessness. He may notice physical sensations, like how tight his jaw is, how clenched his stomach is, how his hands are tightening into fists. And he notices thoughts like, they'll never learn. They never listen to me. This is hopeless. Now notice that he observes this and allows himself to notice all this without automatically jumping to change anything, without reacting to it in the usual automatic autopilot way. Just doing this also creates that space inside of him. I hope he remembers to do the P, to praise himself for doing it, because this is significant. And then he's free to choose what's next, how he wants to proceed, how he wants to respond to the kids. And that could be anything. Maybe he still decides to raise his voice. Maybe not. Maybe he tells himself, hey, they're just kids and it's not the end of the world, and figures out some other way of handling it. Maybe he goes and pours himself a stiff shot of something. The choices are endless, but they are choices, not automatic reactions. Awareness lets you choose. So let me tell you how some of my mindfulness students use the stop for real. One man went to the dentist for some extensive dental work. The stop, the conscious breathing, they saved me big time, he told me later. In fact, I got so quiet and calm that the dentist leaned over to check if I was okay. Later, when I could talk, I told her that I was just using the techniques I'd learned in my mindfulness course, and she was really impressed. She says she rarely sees reactions like that, and she's been a dentist for years, and I was really proud of myself for handling it so well. And here's what another student told me. She used the stop when she was on her way to the airport. First, the cabbie who picked her up got lost 
and then they got stuck in heavy traffic. He started to freak out that they'd be late. Normally, she said she would too, but this time, I just kept doing the conscious breathing. I stayed calm and sane and watched time go by and just let it go. I can't thank you enough for teaching me the stop. So let's summarize what we learned today. We started exploring the stop, our stress buster technique that creates that powerful space between stimulus and response. It stands for stop and step out of autopilot. That's the S. The T is take a conscious breath. O, observe your thoughts, your feelings, and sensations with curiosity, non-judgmentally, accepting them as they are. And finally, the P, where you first praise yourself, or if you prefer, pat yourself on the back for doing this, and then proceed to your next activity. Next lesson, we'll keep exploring the stop. We'll begin to talk about mindfulness, what it is and what it isn't. We'll see how mindfulness and the stop are related and how the stop is a way of putting that definition of mindfulness into action in a neat little package in quick steps that are easy to remember and easy to use. Now, let me spell out what we'll be covering in this course and what you can expect to come away with. You've already started learning and practicing the stop. And as we keep going, you will see why this is the frame for the entire course and for all the other topics we'll cover, such as mindfulness, what it is, what it isn't, and why it's important. The importance of attention and how paying attention can train your brain at any age, no matter how old you are. You'll learn the pros and cons of being on autopilot and what's so special about stopping autopilot and focusing on the present moment. You'll learn why compassion is so important. And if you think it's for wimps, think again. You'll learn why being kinder to yourself can actually power up your performance and improve your health. We'll talk about stress. Is it always bad? The answer may surprise you. And we'll explore this super important question. What's in this for you? Why are you bothering with this course in the first place? Just because everyone, the media, your friends, your doctor tells you you should? That's not good enough. It's really important to know your own why. I can teach you all kinds of techniques and you can even master them. But once that's done, to really make this your own, to make it part of your life, you have to do two important things. You have to know your why, and you have to tailor what you're learning to your own life and needs. Then you'll be able to sustain what you learn here through the course and beyond. As you can see, we'll be covering a lot but this won't be a bunch of theoretical lectures. We'll be combining theory and practice. This is not just a course about mindfulness. It's an experience of mindfulness, training in mindfulness. I'll also repeat and review things a lot. That's a hallmark of all ALP courses, since the research shows that repetition is the key to mastery. And it's especially important when you're learning a life skill like mindfulness that you want to use under duress. It's like training first responders with lots of drills. More drill, more skill. Because as the ancient Greek soldier and poet Archilochus said, we don't rise to the level of our expectations. We fall to the level of our training. So to ramp up that training, it's important to practice on your own between lessons. First of all, you ought to test out everything I'm teaching and see how it works for you. When my kids were little, they watched a TV show called Reading Rainbow. 
Every segment included a recommendation for some favorite children's book. But the host, LeVar Burton, always warned, don't take our word for it, check it out for yourself. The same is true here. Don't take my word for it, check it out for yourself. And if this stuff does speak to you and you drill, you make it yours. The more you practice, the more proficient, the more powerful you'll be. So here's what I suggest you experiment and play around with following this lesson. First of all, consider listening to a new lesson every week and practice as much as you can in between. First, practice the stop regularly as pure practice, not when you're actually under stress. This is like basic training. You train first in boot camp, not on the battlefield. Whenever you come to a real stop sign, do a stop. Red lights and crosswalks work too. Deliberately make the stop part of your day. Set some kind of a timer to ring at preset times, maybe three times a day at meals or every hour on the hour. You decide. And when it rings, do the stop. And then just proceed with your day. Or you can pick one routine activity that you do anyway and tie the stop to that. Like just before you start eating, do a stop. Or just before you brush your teeth, as you wait for your laptop to power up, or before you check your emails. One activity to start. Easy does it. Now, you'll probably need lots of reminders for these to jog your memory. Oh yeah, <laughs> time for a stop. So put reminders all over. Sticky notes on the mirror, above the sink, post-its above your laptop, a reminder propped up against the salt shaker, things like that. If you want to keep this private, make up some private code just for you. A favorite cartoon, a mug you like, some ringtone that makes you smile. Be creative. Go crazy. Have fun with this. Yeah, life is serious, but it doesn't have to be grim. Lighten up. Now, if you're in some stressful situation and you want to give it a try, go, go for it. That's the goal anyway. And don't worry if you remember it only after the fact, you know, shoulda, coulda, woulda. It takes practice, patience, and persistence to catch yourself being swept up in something, be able to step back from it and do a stop. So celebrate what works and notice and learn from what doesn't. Be kind to yourself. Terrific. So before we end, let's do one last stop for today. So stepping out of autopilot, of keeping on barreling through the lesson, that's the S, beginning to create that space between the stimulus and the response. And now taking a conscious breath, breathing in, I know I'm breathing in and breathing out. I know I'm breathing out. That's the T. Observing how you're feeling, what's on your mind, and what's going on in your body. That's the O. Just observing it just as it is. Give you a little time for that. And now coming to the P, first praising yourself. Congratulations, you did it. And now we'll proceed. And what's next? In our next lesson, we'll start investigating what mindfulness is all about. And we'll keep on practicing. So stay tuned. Thanks for being with me on this journey. Be safe be healthy, and I'll see you again in our next lesson of Everyday Mindfulness.